Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. Well, if you hear the word sorosuke, uh, which means uh, uh, in, uh, in English, uh, speaking up, uh, is perhaps a term used for young people uh, before and after the NSAS protest. Well, it's a time to say, speak up on the issues of governance. But it does look like that terminology has now been adopted uh, by some very elderly and eminent Nigerians who today have come to forward to say they are concerned about the situation of the country. They are expert professionals and also elder statesmen in their own right. Some of them, which include Professor Abba Al Kazum, Abu Bakar Sidiq Mohammed, Akilu Fatima, Dr. Bugaje Uzman, Mr. Clement Uwanko, Professor Jibrin Ibrahim, Mr. John Oda, Mr. Kole Shetima, Mr. Uh, NOB, Mr. Salihu Muhammad Kabir, Honorable Uche Onye Gocha, and Mr. YZ Yao. All of them came together and they put pen to paper on a particular piece titled Nigeria at a Crossroad. They said, in the last almost 25 years, our governance and democracy has been threatened. Now, they did not only put forward the problems of this country, they came with solutions. I'm being joined tonight by a democracy and governance advocate and a scholar, Professor Ibrahim Jibrin, is one of the elder statesmen and eminent Nigerians who have put forward this piece, Nigeria at a Crossroad. Thank you so much, Prof, uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you. How bad is the situation that we are in as a people? Because reading through the piece, I saw the depth of the analysis. It's quite a long read uh, for a short piece. And you will wonder, uh, it must have been something that you and your friends have been looking and thinking about for a while now. But for you to come out at this time, what prompted it? And how bad are the things that we are, the, the situation we are in today? We came out at this time because we are alarmed. We are alarmed. Governance is collapsing completely in this country. We are alarmed because there is a complete breakdown of public trust between citizens and the government. And that we use the word crossroad to indicate that at this point, it's either government sits up and starts putting policies that work, or the country itself would crumble. And that's why we feel that we need to review what has been happening over the past. Get out of the present conjuncture and look at the process in depth with a focus of what can be done to address these issues so that we will begin to move the country forward. The risk at this time is extremely high and we need drastic action. And that action has to be in terms of actually implementing policies. The key thing we point out is that policy is a set of action that addresses a problem, that solves a problem. When you articulate policies and that problem remains unsolved and actually worsens, it means you are not implementing any policy. That is, you are saying one thing and doing exactly the opposite, and that's why there is no forward movement in the country. Mm. Uh, uh, you made reference to the last 25 years, so you are not specifically talking about the Balatunubu government. You are talking about the promises which brought about the civilian back civilian rule in this country. The reasons why military take over power in this country and the excuses is almost they are using the same script whenever the military come into power. They will say they want to fight corruption and correct the ills and the corruption that the civilian government has left. For well, 25 years down the line, what you have described in your piece looks like a backwardness rather than progress. How bad, I mean, you were one of those who were at the vanguard, you know, when we crossed the, uh, the Rubicon, when we crossed from a military era into a civilian route in 1999. Are you disappointed at where we are today, considering the hopes and aspiration of the average Nigerian as a then, at least a young adult who thought that we are entering into a future, or a, a, a future that brings a, a hopeful one for Nigeria at that time? 
All the 12 of us who wrote this piece were very active participants in the struggle to end military rule. We were on the barricades. We engaged the process. We were consistent and we achieved results. The promise we made to Nigerians when we are fighting military rule is that when we have a return to democracy, there's going to be a profound change in which public resources will be used for the public good. Today, 25 years down the line, we look back and we saw that the promise we made have not been realized because those who have been in successive governments since uh, 1999 have not kept to the promise of using public resources to pursue the public good. What they have done is to use public resources for their personal aggrandizement. The corruption that we have today is nowhere near what we had uh, previously. In addition, because there is an abandonment of policy implementation on all sectors of the uh, society, you have on the one hand the economy collapsing completely, and the corollary to that has been the massive growth of insecurity as more and more Nigerians realize this ruling class is not going to do anything for them, and self-help becomes a new ideology. When we are told today that millions of Nigerian youth have procured arms, it is telling you something, that this society has realized that the ruling class we have is extremely irresponsible and has not focused on the development of the society. So, so Prof, of the, the political system in Nigeria has failed. It you has described them as insensit insensitive. Absolutely. And one thing that you said that came out to me, you said, and I quote the words of, of this article, he said the tragedy of the last one year is that we now have a regime that has not only doubled our troubles, but has shown neither empathy, prudence, nor competence in governance. That is a summary of the Bola Tunubu of the last one year and his administration. Is that the position of the group? Absolutely. Because governments are judged by their acts of commission and by their acts of omission. Specific policies were put in place that have been extremely disastrous for the economy and for the people surviving within uh, that uh, economy. And those positive policies that were promised, the palliatives, for example, the Nigerian poor have never, ever seen that palliatives. We know we are told on a daily basis that billions and billions have been given to state governments and to federal ministries to address the problems of the poor. But those of us in contact with the poor, we have never met any poor Nigerian that had ever benefited from what is being said. In that case, what is happening is that the government is this country is telling stories that are not based on any reality. And that's why citizens are exasperated because they don't see a relationship between what is said by government and what's happening in their daily lives. You criticize the major decisions of the Balatunobu government and you've related it, or I mean, you've linked it with the problems of food inflation, food shortages, insecurity, and corruption. And in fact, you are saying that the lifestyle of, the, of government officials are anything on, but underwhelming. And you have said uh, in, those, uh, in that article, you said the withdrawal of petroleum subsidy without any plans to cushion the effect and send prices through the roof, the floating of the Naira, uh, and the IMF has sent the Naira crushing, causing chaos in the economy and poverty in the society. The rise in taxation and electricity bills has led to closure of many businesses and even private schools are finding it difficult to operate. The executive and the legislature 
some would, including the judiciary, appear to be in court to plunder the country to the finish. If you describe the government of the day as such, it, lo it looks to me that there is no trust that you have given this government. And this government will tell you that, look, what we have done is in tandem with the yearnings of a lot of Nigerians, experts who have said, this is the way to go, remove subsidy, float the Naira, uh, um, crush the, the multiple exchange windows. And this is what they say they have done. The government of the day will say, wait for us a moment, that some of the actions and policies of our government will start yielding results. It's just a matter of time. Is it that you and your friends are impatient with this government to see the result or what exactly is going on? <laughs> Nigerians have a memory. Remember when they did this uh, fuel price uh, removal of subsidy? They said in weeks we'll have uh, LNG buses and the prices of transport will crash. That was 13 months ago that they said that. And Nigerians know they haven't seen those things. This idea is called waiting for Godot in world literature, mm -hmm. where you are told continuously the good things we have done, you will see them soon. And you go from weeks to months to years, and you don't see that good coming. Then you know that what you are being told is a narrative that is not based on any reality. And that's, the res that's why Nigerians today are very upset and are very angry, because they are being deceived regularly and systematically by a government that feels, oh, we can tell stories, we will survive, we will refuse to do what we need to do, and we will survive because we will tell stories that will cover up our non-deeds or our bad deeds. And at some point, Nigerians have to say, no, you can't continue to tell us. Well, have you written the Tinubu government off? It's just one year and two months in office. Well, you see, if in 14 months you are unable to show progress, then we don't see how that progress will come in four years. Because progress has to start immediately because the crisis is serious. And it has to be incremental. So 14 out of 48 months that they, that, that they asked, I mean, that they were voted for, you think that 14 months uh, is fundamental, is basic, is a foundational period that we should start seeing results. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. That if by now we haven't started seeing results, it means those results are not on the way. So you've written this government off. You don't think anything fruitful can come in the next four No, years? no, no. We are telling this government that you can't continue by giving false narratives. You have to actually start putting sets of policies in place that will address the issue. Let me explain something, for example, that's very straightforward to you. There's this story that we've been giving billions and billions to state governments to use for palliatives and to address the food uh, problems in their states. And it's true those monies are given to state governments. What happens to this money? That's the, the question you have to answer. Everybody in this country knows what happens. It goes to the governor, the governor takes it, and then distributes it to local governments. Local governments give this to wards. But who does it get to at the federal, state, local government and ward levels? It goes to the party barons who are in power. And they, therefore, corner all these resources that are coming in and refuse to distribute it to those who are actually in need. And everybody knows that this money, these resources, these grains that are distributed never gets to those in need. It goes to those who are already enjoying vast salaries, vast allowances, and then they take these palliatives and add to their wealth mm. and accumulation. So that's the story. Since no government in this country can pretend it doesn't know that's what's happening, you can't continue doing the same thing and expect you will get a different result. Yeah, that's prof, the point we are saying. Prof, so I, the policy yeah. of government in terms of these palliatives is to make sure the poor never gets it. Uh, as, as direct 
and, and as uh, punchy as your criticism of this government is, uh, compared to other uh, uh, citizens who criticize this government that never come up with solutions, you have proffered some solutions. And I love the fact that you put your solution in three strata. Uh, the economy, security, and corruption. Time may not permit us to be able to touch on all of this, but at least we, we can show our viewers what the, the solutions that you're, you're proffering. Uh, first, in the state of the economy, you were talking about the revitalized social safety net program to capture and deliver to the most vulnerable. If you can summarize the thought of your group, on the way to go for this economy, just in about a minute, so that we can move to the next and up to the next one too. Yeah, the point we are saying is this question of providing for the poor. Everybody knows where the poor are in this country and everybody can identify them. Why is it that you only distribute to politically exposed individuals, knowing fully well those politically exposed individuals who feel they are entitled to gather all the resources of societies for their own family needs and aggrandizement. By so doing, you are making sure that you deepen the gulf between the ordinary people who are in real uh, trouble and the political class that has completely lost touch with the reality of what's happening in their own society. And what we are saying is this, the social distance between government and the people in this country has become extremely wide. And there's a certain callousness, wickedness of people in government who don't appear to be worried at all about the hunger in the land. I mean, one of the issues people encounter in this country on a daily basis is that when they fall sick and they see medical personnel, they are given a prescription, they can't buy the drugs. And every day, people are dying in this country because they are sick. Their sickness is curable, but they don't have the money to buy the drugs. People are beginning to starve in this country. And what does government say? Oh, some political enemies are mobilizing them to agitate. So what government is saying, people are starving, they should starve quietly and not make noise so that nobody will hear that they are starving till they die. And people are now saying, no, for heaven's sake, we are not going to starve to death silently. We are going to scream. We are going to make the point that we voted for government to address our problems, and they are not addressing their problems, and they are letting us waste in this so, society. So you are advocating for more inclusion, money to get right to the grassroots, to soccer for, for the average person. In the area of security, I see that you are, uh, you are asking or preferring solution uh, in the way of establishment of a national security coordination center. You are also asking for an establishment of a national peace building and a constellation commission. Some of the solutions that you're proffering in the security aspect are more of a, 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 a people-oriented psychological effort. Why? Do you think that we do not need the guns and the, and the, uh, and the, and the bullets? For example, in this country, security has been collapsing for over two decades. We have an Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution in the country. That institute is located under the rubrics of the foreign ministry. The foreign ministry has no mandate for internal security. So this institute has been idle for the last 25 years because 25 years ago, a mistake was made and they were put in the wrong ministry. And, over, and that's why we're saying it's a collective responsibility of successive governments, because it was Obasanjo who started that institute and put it in the wrong ministry. And now, 25 years later, it's still in the wrong ministry. It means nobody in government is actually looking at their agencies and saying, how do we use this agency to address problems that are actually happening uh, in society. The, and that's why we are saying is, is available. Yeah, and that's what we are saying is 
policy is not just saying you have written things on paper. It's also looking to see how it will work. So oh, if this institute yeah. hasn't worked for this period, over 20, almost 25 years, then you should do what you need to do to make it to work. Prof, we are totally out of time. But the corruption area, you're asking for a creation of Operation Clean Sweep, that it should launch a high-profile, rigorous uh, anti-corruption campaign against prominent Nigerians, especially political export persons. I'd like you to wrap up in just 30 seconds on that effort. Will it work? Have we not been seeing this kind of thing before? Well, it has not worked. And what we are saying is that the reason it has not worked is that the center of corruption is government. And therefore, these people in government decide we are not going to deal with corrupt people because we are the ones. And I am saying, and we are saying, that no, you have to change that attitude because everybody now knows that's what government is doing and that it's because of this level of corruption that we are paying the price of hunger and misery and ill health in this country. And that if we don't start seeing people in government held accountable for their acts of corruption, right. there is no really uh, will on the part of government right. to move the country forward. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Abraham uh, Jibrin, who is a governance and democracy advocacy uh, advocate and a scholar. Uh, is one of the eminent Nigerians who came together and uh, who brought up this document, Nigeria at a crossroad and proffering solutions, some of which we showed you on the screen tonight. Thank you so much indeed for your time. And we wish our nation the very best. My it's regards to you and your colleagues too. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. And that's uh, the edition for today. Many thanks, everyone, for being part of it. I'm Sean Akimale. I'll see you next time. God bless Nigeria.